this is Gian Chirol, our honorable guest, our honorable. Uh, we are uh, so we will be able to start the lecture on pursuing the common good, sir. So please, uh, honor to have you here. Do you want to use a mic? Teresa, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be giving this uh, talk uh, in front of a, such a distinguished audience. Um, I also realize that I'm the last obstacle between you and this wonderful f food that we are smelling. <laughs> so, but I will, shall I speak a bit louder, okay. So, this is, um, first I would like to thank also the Franco-Indian uh, Institute and CFIPRA for organizing this trip. Uh, my wife Natalie and I had a wonderful time. It's the last leg of the trip and uh, Sefi Price done a really, really impressive job at uh, taking good care of us and organi organizing this kind of event, um, which has been tremendously interesting. So I will discuss a little bit the pursuit of the common good. And maybe I should tell you a little bit about this? Yes, I can just use this. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago I wrote a book entitled Economics for the Common Good. And the reason why I wrote that a little, little thing on the panel's personal side is that uh, I'd been working um, with industry, with uh, ministries, with central banks, with competition authorities and the like. So with experts in general. Um, for quite a number of years, but never interacted with a broader audience. And what I tried to do is actually to share that knowledge. Uh, the tipping point was, two tipping points actually. The first was the Nobel Prize, because of course you get much more recognitions with the Nobel Prize and you know, people recognize me in the street and so on, ask, ask me, you know, what are you doing in the end? You know, what, <laughs> what is your job? <laughs> Is, is economics a science? Is that any useful? So that kind of thing that I, I thought there was a duty. Uh, the second tipping point was also the rise of the populist movements everywhere in the world. That was, you know, we saw that coming in, uh, in, in the US and the UK, even so the 2016 elections were coming. And this creepy tendency somehow tells you something, which is that the expertise should be shared with a wide public and not just a, a small number of experts. And that's, I think, is very important if we want to make pros progress and keep our democracies. So, um, the social duty of an economist, just like any scientist, I mean, there are many scientists among you, and not only economists, is actually to share uh, some deciphering keys about our world, to understand the society we live in, and also, in the case of economics, my, my vision of economics as a moral and philosophical science. So, what is a common good? You write a book on the common good, and you buy it as well. You can go back to that, I don't know if it's... Uh, no, it doesn't work, still doesn't work. And the starting point is that there are many situations in which the interests of citizens, of companies, of governments, of countries diverge from the general interest. So for example, we as citizens, we all know we emit too much carbon. Some of us will refuse to be vaccinated. We may overconsume antibiotics. Just a couple of examples among thousands of examples. Businesses and banks can also abuse their position, they may uh, enjoy market power and abuse their monopoly position. They may also take too much risk, just like when banks actually are, are taking risk and you know, endangering, jeopardizing the, the savings of uh, depositors, maybe taxpayer money. Uh, the state may engage in excessive spending deliver poor education to the children or to the mass of children, tolerate too much inequality, create a financial crisis by not regulating carefully the banks. And of course, countries, we see the primacy of, uh, of the national interest over the interest of the world. And you see that repeatedly with global warming. Every country or most countries are actually waiting for the other countries to act. 
uh, trade wars, fiscal competition, and of course, military conflicts. So what is a common feature to all those behaviors? Well, simply that individual interest trumps the general interest. And the ambition of the economics for the common good is to align the individual interest with the general interest, and there are two instruments to do that. The first instrument is persuasion. So basically, you try to persuade uh, citizens and corporations and, and governments actually to act nicely. So that's the case of corporate social responsibility, encouraging good citizen behavior and so on. Sociologists try to base, to, to design more norms, norms based interventions to boost awareness of the consequences of selfishness or change a social norm. But there are limits to what can be done with that and you know, one of the limits is observed uh, in, in the matter of climate change. The Rio summit in 1992 had identified pretty much all the primes with, with climate change. And 30 years later, we haven't done very much, and we are very, be very much behind in what should be done. So that's one, pro one approach, which is persuasion. There is another approach which is very important, it's incentives. Because they are, they are needed to put the general interest back in the center, okay? And the economists have been working a lot on that, and climate, climate change is no exception. As long as the incentives are not right, we'll, we'll see way too many emissions and really a big danger for the planet. Now, how do you define the common good? That was just an introduction. And it's just a thought experiment, which is called the veil of ignorance. So it has a long tradition in, in philosophy under which uh, you try to abstract yourself from your position in society. So imagine that you are not born yet. Okay, you're not born yet, and so that means we, you don't know whether you'll be a man or a woman, whether you'll be born in India or in France, whether um, you'll be born in a rich family or a poor family, in a big city like Delhi or in the rural area, and whether your parents will be you know, having an education and so forth, and what your religious preference will be, and, and so on and so forth. So you don't know why you're, you're going to be one of those persons in society. And you ask yourself a very, very simple question. What kind of society would I like to live in? Okay, that's the thing. I mean, it seems very simple, but it's very hard to do. Because we all have a position in society. You know, we know whether we are man or woman. We, we know whether we're rich or poor and so on. So we all have a position in society, so it's very difficult actually to abstract oneself from that position. But nonetheless, that's what we want to do because we would like to know, you know, what kind of society would you, we would like to live in, in the abstract, you know, without knowing law. Which was a very generous uh, uh, kind of thought, but you know, in practice, if you don't have the incentives, it's not going to work, and very quickly, the, this dream became a dictatorship, was, was an economic disaster, uh, and then the deprivation of freedom, uh, cultural disaster, environmental disaster, and so on. And it's not, it's not a matter of people, because you might think, you know, we had the wrong people, no. Uh, that in ca some cases that may be the case, but in practice, it's also that you know, the incentives were not there, and it could not really work. Uh, this myth of a new man, there was no talk about new woman at the time. Enough uh, purchasing power, because we need money to finance health, uh, education, uh, social welfare, public, public welfare, and so on. Um, and to do that, you need a strong uh, legal framework, you need more generally infrastructures, you need economists to work on all day long. You also need a number of insurance mechanisms because behind the, the veil of ignorance, you don't know who you are going to be. So you like to be insured against basically um, who you are going to be. And a trivial example of that is that behind the veil of ignorance, you don't know whether you'll be a man or a woman, and therefore there should be a gender e equality, period. But more generally, you also want uh, universal health coverage. When you are born, you just don't know 
um, whether you have the right genes or the wrong one, maybe you'll get a cancer or something like that, and you want to have universal health coverage, and that cannot be left to the market, because the market won't give you the, the insurance, um, at least the, you know, the insurance, uh, the health insurance. Uh, more generally, you, you want to have protection against life mishaps. You want to have equal opportunity, a right to do good education for everyone, because again, you'll grow up in, in Delhi and go to a good, good school, or you know, in the whole area and so on. You, you want to correct all kinds of religious, ethnic, political, sexual, and so on. You really want to have much tolerance, because beyond the veil of ignorance again, you like to live in a tolerant society. So even so, this is a very simple question. There is a lot of what social sciences do, which is actually get an answer, at least in terms of objective, get an answer uh, in this simple thought experiment. Let me say a few words about the economist mission. And you know, the mission of the economist is, of course, to increase the toolbox, to you know, offer a toolbox for policymakers actually to act and try to act in the best way. Even the objective function, which has been fixed now, I've discussed an objective function. But there are many challenges that face the economist nowadays. There is change, in particular technological change is accelerating, which is, which is excellent. Because, this, but of course, it also creates a number of challenges. So, for example, the digital economy or genetics will really not through unemployment, social science fiction. And we economists, like many social scientists, we tend to be behind. So, we, we try to understand the past, which is very useful, of course. But we need to also to anticipate more the future. And that's, that's actually very difficult by definition, because we, we don't have data, but um, we need to do that. We are way behind in terms of uh, AI and genetics and their impact on society, we are, we are behind. We need to understand perceptions better. Um, one of the things that is striking for an economist is that you know the, the, the policies that a large majority of and uh, that's, that's an interesting question. We must think about that. Um, last year, for, for President Macron, Olivier Blanchard and I, and, and a commission of 24 economists, uh, international economists, wrote a, a report uh, called Major Future Economic Challenges. It's available on the web if you are interested. It's in English and in French. Because the idea was basically to design something, it's more Europe actually, than the rest of the world. but. Uh, uh, lots of the issues arise also in the rest of the world. Not, not the, the, the part on aging, the pension reform and the like uh, is, is more French in a sense, but there are lots, there were three topics, global warming, inequality, and, and aging. Um, and if you, if you think about the economist, every economist actually recommends a carbon price, and it's one of the most unpopular uh, one of the most unpopular policies. Most economists recommend an inheritance tax, you know, basically equality of chances. This is also one of the most unpopular policies. Pension, uh, pension system reform is also one of the most unpopular policies. And I could go on and on. So many of the recommendations of economists actually encounter resistance, and that may be that may be fine, maybe we are wrong, but we must also take into account the perception. So in the report, we try to incorporate the perceptions because in the end, you also need to address those perceptions if you want the policy to be implemented. And finally, um, I think very strongly that we have to open ourselves to other social sciences. Um, you may have seen on the first slide I listed one of my affiliations to be the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, which is something we started uh, like 11 years ago, and uh, there's a whole floor in our building which is dedicated to social sciences, um, non-economists, so psychologists, sociologists, uh, anthropologists, historians, and so on. Um, and that's, 
that's a wonderful thing because we are learning a lot, a lot from them. Um, and um, since I'm talking about the Toulouse School of Economics, maybe you will have some students who come. France, like India, has a lot of terrific scientists, not only economists, but of course, we in Toulouse, who like love to at the Toulouse School of Economics, we love to get some bright young minds um, in economics, but also in in other social and you know talk a little bit about policy policies and when they are implemented or not. Something that I've noticed in my career is that you know the the ability to influence policy depends very much on the kind of institution which is going to implement those policies. So in France like everywhere else or in Europe you have you have a big difference between independent agencies or sorry independent authorities which are not politically driven and the political decision in ministries. And you know the work we have done in Toulouse for example has made its way relatively fast um, in competition law, in, in banking regulation, or in macroprudential policies, it's a bit banking regulation, uh, with independent authorities. Whereas recommendations, uh, which are more political in a sense, they are in the political domain, um, are much slower or don't have any effect. So the example of that, you know, since the early 90s, I, I've been going to ministries and say, hey, this is dangerous, we need a carbon price. Can we imp implement a carbon price? And you know, the answer is, you know, in all, almost all countries in the world, uh, that hasn't been done. I mean, there are 40, 45 cap and trade mechanisms around the world, you know, from California to China. But the prices are about five, five dollars per ton of CO2, when we economists think it should be $100 per ton of CO2. So we are way behind, almost everywhere in the world. We have had a carbon price in a, for some of the emissions in Europe, uh, close to 100, it went down a bit. And the streets in Sweden, they have had $100, over $100 per ton of carbon since 1991-92, which is remarkable. But today, you know, most countries still have five, five dollars per ton of carbon. And it, it's not going to lead anywhere, you know, because, uh, you know, we might as well, as well pollute, unfortunately, at that price. Whereas if we had a price of 50, 60 or 70 uh, dollars per ton, there would be lots of efforts. So, for example, lots of coal mines would be closed if, if you had this price of carbon. But it has been a failure, to be honest. I mean, in the, in the report with Olivier Blanchard, we are we are much more balanced than just saying carbon price, which the economists always say carbon price, carbon price, carbon price. But what we point out in, in the report is that it doesn't suffice. You need much, much more than that. In particular, a very strong uh, green, disruptive green R&D effort. And we, at this stage, we need that very badly. We need a lot of other things, compensation, domestic compensation, compensation across countries. We could discuss that if you want, but um, something that was implemented, but uh, pretty slowly with Olivier Blanchard, actually, we worked together over 20 years ago. And we, 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 dis we basically wanted to have a layoff tax uh, organized as a bonus and malus. So, if you lay off a lot of people, then you you'll pay you'll pay malus, you you pay more social security taxes. But if you do f f fewer layoffs, then you you have a bonus in terms of social security taxes. And I remember at the time we met with with unions, we met with politicians, and they said, mm, "Interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it." And um, that that started being implemented last September in France in a timid way, but you know, at least it's starting. And you know, who knows, this report with Olivier Blanchard, to be honest, it didn't have much impact on the elections, but we knew that because if you start about talking about topics which are very unpopular, you don't expect them to be adopted in a, in a program, either the President Macron or the opposition. I mean, this was a report for everyone. And, but you know, 
the important thing I think we are not we are not the decision maker as an economist I, I should not substitute for decision makers I'm not legitimate uh, what we can do is actually increase the size of the toolbox and you know if it doesn't happen you know maybe it's a bad idea maybe you know it has to be appropriated by by the citizens and the politicians that's fine I mean I, I don't mind um, so we have to think about the long term and try to improve our policy for that now in all in all countries you re have we re have a, a question with expertise and that has been the same in, in most countries um, you know Michael Gove in the UK uh, one of the designer of Brexit basically said we are fed up with, with experts. But this is very typical. You hear that many, many times in many, many different countries. And of course, you know, any expert, um, many experts who are in direct contact with society, not only economics, but think about medicine, biology, uh, climate, climate change in the US, or evolutionary theory in in the US and I could go on and on. Anytime you have a contact with society, then uh, you'll be dismissed as being an expert, a biased, out of touch person, um, and so on. Now, there are specificities to, to economics. Um, the distress of markets, uh, hostility to incentives, sometimes hostility to the policy evaluation. Um, maybe we'll discuss that later on. But but it's true that there is a very strong uh, disregard uh, for experts uh, by, by to understand what's going on. And one of the things I try to talk about in the book is actually our cognitive biases. And by the way, this is not trying to insult people. I have a lot of con cognitive biases myself, so I have my own share of cognitive biases. And I think everybody does. Um, and one of the things which is shared among many, many people is motivated beliefs. Uh, motivated beliefs is basically that we believe what we want to believe, we see what we want to see. And by the way, the social networks are extremely good at basically feeding you with, with stuff that you want to hear, right? Of putting you in touch with people who think like you. And, and that's, that's an issue. Now, is that purely dysfunctional? No. I mean, there's a good reason why we have this cognitive bias. Uh, we have, you know, we have motivated, motivated beliefs because it's more comfortable. You know, we have some beliefs. We want to first think that we are right. That's quite, quite human. And then there are things which are more comfortable to believe. So, for example, something I've encountered many times is that people believe, want to believe that climate change will go away by itself. So it might be, for example, that there will be huge technological progress. Well, that's suggesting we don't have to incur costs, and our planet is worth enough, I think, to save, and we have to spend that money. Um, but you could, uh, you know, in many countries, for example, people don't want to accept the, that the education system is is extremely unequal. There are lots of books about that. We know that there's a huge amount. Equality of chances, actually, in my view, is basically the most important equality. Now, it's not the only one. There are many others which are extremely important. But you know, the equality of chances is really violated in most countries, and you know, and by a, by a large amount. Um, and something, perhaps for economists, something that that is. Uh, thing is that people don't like to believe that economic actors um, need incentives okay uh, why why we don't like to think that economic actors need incentives well simply because we would like to live in a world where people are nice and you know they basically do the right thing by themselves you don't have to force them or give them an incentive or carrot in order to act properly so when an economist comes in and says, hey, you need an incentive, look, we have evidence. You know, without incentives, it doesn't work. If you give an incentive, it can work. Um, you know, basically we are saying, well, people are not as nice as we would like them to be. Now we can bury our head in the sand, but that's not necessarily optimal. So in a sense, we are a little bit bearers of bad news. 
because we are we are really saying well incentives are needed by the way legal scholars are often more clever than economists because they will say you know for example if I invest in something then I may get property rights to it and economists will say it's efficient because the property right is what gives incentive to invest the legal scholar will say it's fair of course the legal scholar means exactly the same thing but people like to uh, the concept of fairness more than the concept of incentive. Now, to criticize economists, uh, it may also be the case that we destroy social norms. So, you know, a worldview is really that incentives are needed. Of course, you know, much of our work actually is about when incentives actually don't work that well. So, we bring in caveats. I've been working a lot on that actually, looking at situations where incentives don't work that well. You know, but by and large, we are thinking about incentives as being crucial, and the carbon price is one good example of that. Now, it's true that by sending the message that incentives are needed, we're also sending a message which is not too optimistic about human, human behavior, and that may spill over into uncontrolled aspects of life. That's, that's a possibility. What's mean, what I mean here is that you know, you may be controlling a behavior through incentive, but then, you know, you change a behavior in those areas which you cannot control through incentives. Because you have changed a social norm, that's a possibility, at least a theoretical possibility, and, and there should be more work, in particular on, on vehicle work done on that. Um, I don't know how much, I don't want to hold you up and, and take too much of your time, but uh, then, Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, another cognitive bias um, we have is we often stop at first impressions. Uh, all of us, I mean, because going beyond that is actually requires uh, cognitive resources. I mean, it's not, it's not that people are stupid. It's more that we are all lazy in a sense. So you're trying to go through the entire reasoning is often, often time consuming and that's an issue. So, so often people see the direct effect of economic policy and they don't go beyond that and see the indirect effects. So we economists talk often about generic, generic EVM effects. Uh, so for example, let me give you an example. The clean development mechanism designed by the Kyoto Agreement in 1997 was basically a nice mechanism in which people in Europe could actually, for example, save a forest in Indonesia and get credits in Europe for that, okay? But that, f that ignores the fact that if you save a forest in Indonesia, that forest will have been cut for good, pr for certain purposes like you know, extract wood or, or, or have soy or something like that. But then that means that the price of soy or the price of wool will go up, meaning that some of the forests elsewhere will be actually destroyed. Um, rent control. Okay, rent control is another example. It's a very popular policy, but of course it backfires after a while and it actually hurts the people who the policy was, whom the policy was intended to help. Because after a while there is a shortage of housing, there is no longer building of such housing, and there is no maintenance of such housing. Same thing, in, in many countries there are subsidies, especially in France, but there are many subsidies uh, for people who don't have much money, like students, uh, for housing purposes. That the price goes up, and actually is the, Economists usually estimate that 75% of the state subsidy, of the government subsidy, fires because you're make, making rich people even richer. And I could go on and on like this. Okay, so that's a difficult situation because you have to convince those about the indirect effects. Couple, of, I'm going to go very fast through that. Couple of other issues we refuse to consider a second dilemma. Um, those dilemmas have a reason, for example, during COVID, when we have a limited number of hospital uh, 
uh, intensive care units. But it's more, much more important, it's going to become even more important with AI. I mean, a colleague of mine was like, very, very interesting. Those of you who know the trolley dilemma that philosophers work on, it's, it's a typical trolley dilemma. Misunderstanding of statistics. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of misunderstanding. Um, something which is used a lot by, by populists is the confusion between correlation and causality. So, you know, you might, people don't, don't understand necessarily that a correlation is not a causality. Mm, yeah. this, this audience will understand, but uh, often people are confused and they see a correlation and they transform that in a, into a causality. Um, so, for the French people, we had this, uh, this comedian, uh, Coluche. Um, he was saying, you know, don't go to the hospital because the probability of dying in an hospital is higher than the probability of dying at home, which is true. It's a correlation, but of course, the causality is completely wrong. Uh, you know, updating differs very much from the Bayesian benchmark. Sal salience is very important. Divisive issues is complex to, to, to communicate on. And we scientists, and here, it's not only economists, all scientists have to confront that. The political debate, the public debate, is around narratives, not facts. Scientists rightly care about facts, but the debate is about narratives, okay? And those narratives is some kind of storytelling, which basically um, also talks about things that people want to hear. Again, motivated beliefs, for example, is important. We all want to have a bright future, so we want to believe in a bright future. And that's something that, that is being used by populists um, in narratives. We all know that perspective taking is very important. So, for example, you had had many drawings of migrants in the Mediterranean, but it's a statistic. People didn't react to that. And then they saw a child on a beach, a dead child on a beach. And that was, that was a drama. And it was a drama, of course. But, you know, the important fact was that the number of people who actually died in this way. But, you know, the picture of the child was much more powerful to elicit some emotion from people than the statistic. You know, the Stalin used to say, I mean, I hate to, to quote Stalin, but St Stalin used to say, you know, one person is a drama. You know, a million, per one person dead is a drama. One million person dead is a statistic, right? Uh, we forget about that. Um, I, I mentioned confusion between correlation and causality, and all kinds of excuses, including feeble excuses. In economics, we run a lot of experiments on the wall of feeble excuses that are extremely powerful. So. I'm going to leave you with a question. Uh, it's a question for you because I really don't have the answer. The question is, how are we going to win the narrative war? So that, well, let me you know, quote a Frenchman, Marcel Proust, a wonderful writer. But he wrote this particular sentence which I find wonderful. The facts do not penetrate the world where our beliefs live. So, if we have beliefs, again, he was talking about motivated beliefs. If we have beliefs, it's very, very difficult to actually impose the facts and make sure the facts actually overcome the beliefs. And he was completely right. This is Marcel Proust. And I also want to recommend a recent book by Steven Pinker. You know, Steven Pinker is very famous. He has this book where he basically covers a number of findings in psychology, economics, and other social sciences, and talking about rationality, and why we are not rational, and whether we should be rational, and so on. Um, I recommend. But then the question is, how can we do? So if we are scientists, we care about facts, and that's uh, what our work is about. And then the debate is not on facts. The debate is on narrative. So 
maybe one of the things we can do is actually try to use narratives. We know that per se they are wrong, this is not the right way to do it, but we have to play that game. And so maybe we, what we can do is to you know, start with a narrative to attract some interest, some intellectual interest, in the, and then move on and present the facts. That would be, I think, honest, but uh, I, don't, I really don't have the answer. If, if you uh, have some ideas, I, I will be very pleased to know. So my view is that economics is a moral and philosophical science, and, and our mission, just like any other social science and any science, uh, is to make this world a better place. That's our mission. But if we want to do that, we also have to dig into account perceptions and cognitive biases, and, and then try to address the key societal challenges of our time, you know, like global warming, the future of labor, international commission, cooperation, inequality, regulation, debt, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so basically use social science analysis and, and never forget about the common good. Thank you very much. Or, or you would like to have it in the... Interaction. Media. Media. Two questions. Two questions. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed the talk very much. I teach economics in the university in Delhi. Uh, you mentioned incentives uh, more than once, and I, I see completely the point. Um, now, to kind of simplify, uh, simplify it, we can possibly think of incentives as being positive or negative in the sense of restraint or. Uh, maybe uh, monetary payment of some kind, or including a negative income tax, if you want uh, Friedman's expression. Uh, do you think there are general principles on the use of incentives, or should it be contextual? Let me just give you a very simple example and end with that. Uh, uh, we seem to have progress in the public discourse, not necessarily among economists, uh, in India uh, from, if you wish, uh, the uh, traditional economist idea of the polluter pays to one where now it's acceptable to argue for side payments made to polluters. Is that ever, in a view, acceptable? Well, thank you. It's, it's a very information also. Is, so, as I mentioned in the, in the report with Olivier Blanchard and this commission, we try actually to address, to measure first and address the perception. I mean, for, ca for carbon price, for example, most politicians say, you know, ecology should not be pu punitive. But what does it mean? We have to spend money in order to fight climate change. So, in a sense, it has to be punitive. Uh, you know, the, again, you know, it's a tr it's a trade-off between money and saving the planet. So, for me, the trade-off is a no-brainer. But you know. Uh, at some point we'll have to spend money. But something we notice, which is, will be kind of obvious to you, is that a carbon tax is incredibly unpopular. It's true in most countries. Um, now, there are things which are equivalent to a carbon tax, but are not unpopular because people don't know about it. The cap and trade mechanism is typical of that. It's paid by the industry and nobody knows about it. But perhaps more interestingly, is subsidies are very popular. Subsidies are incredibly popular. People love to get subsidies. They totally forget that the subsidy is a tax. It will have to be financed in some way. And, and sometimes by the same people, sometimes by different people. But so for example, in most countries, renewables have been financed by feed-in tariffs. So basically, people who install solar or, or wind had a guaranteed price above the market price and it was basically a subsidy to that. Now that showed in the electricity bill, but most people didn't even know about it. Now, I'm not saying we should not be doing that, but the point is that, you know, that changes the perspective. You know, if you call that a tax or subsidy, it completely changes, and that's connected you with your question, obviously. You know, if you know, the thing is, how do you do change the reference point in the sand? You would like to start with a high reference point and then get get it down somehow, rather than raising your tax. Um, that's a difficult thing, and that has to do with perception. The economics remain the same, but we need to make all our policies more popular. 
And that's also a way of, uh, it's very important also the way you present it. So I think we should try to do more of a combination of a norms based intervention and of, uh, of an incentive. So uh, about 10 years ago, in France, in Spain, in many countries, um, it was decided to prohibit uh, smoking in public spaces. And you know, in countries where people smoke a lot, like France or, or Spain, I was kind of expecting it to be a failure. But there was, uh, there was both, you know, the, the carrot, which was, you know, you could get a fine for smoking in a public space, but there was also a very strong change in social norm. So that actually people, you know, basically the, the carrot together with the campaign basically said, no, no, that's not admissible. And then basically people stopped smoking in public even when there was no police, right? Where there, there was probably zero of being caught. So that, that was a good example where you change the incentive and you also change the social norm. And perhaps we should do that with, with climate change as well, saying no, we all have a responsibility, you know, there are things we should not be doing individually, but combined with incentives and a carbon price, for example, you know, that actually might reinforce because there's still people who say, I don't care. Um, but you know, the economist is not an expert for that, but you know, I think it's a good, it's a good way of doing it. So, last one more question. Rest, we can continue. Institutional economics, so <laughs> ecological economics. In, in, in um, so, my question is specifically about what you said about green growth. Um, you seem to be very skeptical about it. Uh, I like what you've written in your book too. So, I just wanted to, to elaborate a bit on that. The second question that is related to this is about norm making that you said comes from sociology and uh, you didn't kind of see, uh, well, let's say, great institutional economists in Europe like William Karp and others who've written so much about institutional economics and again, the purpose of economics is not really about, according to Karp, is not about, well, let's say, enhancing well-being but about reducing the pain of, well, whatever we do, right, I mean, reducing the social and eco economic or ecological costs of what we do. Um, so the least painful activities, um, Gandhiji's Antioria, whatever, I mean, you can, there are several examples of the sort of the world. Um, I just wonder, at which point do you see economics turning towards sociology? And again, at which point do we see economists accepting Veblen as an economist and not as a sociologist? So, thank you. Well, we'll be much richer and much, much healthier because technological progress is, is fabulous. You know, we see AI, we see the vaccine, we see all those examples, you know, it's growing so fast. So I'm not worried in the long term about our growth, it's going to be very big. Um, if we survive the climate change thing, which is going to create a lot of conflict among countries and so on, I mean, this is going to be terrible. So what I'm worried about green growth is to say that you can have your cake and eat it too somehow. You know, the idea is that we don't have to spend money uh, in order to fight climate change, I think it's a dangerous idea. I understand why public politicians say that, because they want to, you know, they want to convince people to be green in a sense. But that's also a dangerous position because people say, "Oh, fine, I, mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have to pollute because anyway we're going to grow and be green at the same time, and I don't want a carbon price." So uh, it's just a warning in a sense, and I don't want. I'm not totally blaming those people who are using green growth, but I'm very skeptical about it. Um, on sociology, well, I thought Veblen was an economist. <laughs> but there are, you know, there are things in Veblen uh, which have been used by many sociologists, including in France, Boudon, Bourdieu, and so on, which economists have been using on the late. Uh, we, are, we have been behind in that. You know, it's a typical example where your social comparison and social image are very important. That's, that's, a, that's for economists, but you know, there are other, other words, of course, in sociology. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, as I said, you know, at the IST in Toulouse and, uh, and the other interdisciplinary fora, um, we learn a lot from each other. There is an issue with language. So we, you know, sometimes you have to be bilingual, some, <laughs> and you learn the terms in psychology, and when you're an economist, and conversely, and so on, and understand what we do, each, because we don't do quite the same thing. We don't have the same methodology. We study different issues, 
But in the end, we're all studying people, groups, in groups, out groups, organizations, and so on. I mean, in the science, we are studying all the same objects. So, you know, my view is that you know, we should try to learn from each other in order to improve. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir. Long live India and France friendship.